as a mature Christian, we should be so keen to recognize that we are very sinful and we're going to do our best to obviously try not to be sinful. That's the whole process of sanctification and choosing to follow after Jesus. And in doing so, we'll be witnessing to others. And I think that's, you know, the mission and people are able to see little bits of Jesus in us. While we still have those sinful tendencies that, that could lead us down a horrible dictator ass, uh, um, esque, sorry, <laughs> not ask, esque, um, hey now. <laughs> that was bad. Dictator esque mm -hmm. mindset. Instead, we choose to follow the Jesus mindset and therefore trying to be the light of the earth, the salt of the earth as well. Welcome back to another episode of the Campfire Council podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. I am super excited for today. Uh, as you can see, we got a nice little new setup here. Uh, super excited for this. And we're going to be trying something new, actually, with a re reaction video, which Milo is going to explain what we will be doing for today's episode. So, Milo, if you want to go ahead and take it away. All right. So today we're going to be reacting to the impulsive episode. That's Logan Paul and Mike Malak. They had Cliff and Stuart Connectally Correct. on Correctly. their podcast. We just found out that his name is pronounced Connectally. Yep. That was interesting. We and thought it was that wrong. tough pill to swallow. Like yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's rough. But okay, so um, we're going to be reacting to this episode. I just want to start off by saying we're not scholars. We're not experts in the field of theology or philosophy or apologetics or anything like that but we are interested in the topic and uh, we think it's important so also uh this is our first time doing a react type video uh, slash podcast so there may be some technical difficulties so you'll have to bear with us in we case will do our best any errors uh, and so yeah we're, let's get started so uh we're gonna start off with this discussion that they had uh where logan was asking about the soul and I want to say, um, sometimes they, they, it seems like they jump around between subjects a little bit. So uh, we're, we're just going to do our best to uh, answer different topics and ideas as they go. So let's, let's get uh, after it. Yeah, let's play this portion. Because um, I'm so confused what that means. People say, oh, you have no soul or like it's in your soul or, you know, say it with your soul. W what does that mean to you guys? Well, the soul is the person. The soul is the real you, the real me. At 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 the point in which they are presently, mm -hmm. you have a soul. I believe I have a soul. We all have souls, which means we have personhood. Which means you're not just a complex biochemical reaction. I mean, think about it. If there is no God, you and I are simply robots, flesh puppets. Exactly. Yeah. That's all we are. Yeah. <laughs> and it's really fascinating to listen to an atheist, a secularist, a materialist insist, "Oh no, 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 no. There's more to us than that." Really? Sorry. If there is no creator who creates us, then we are matter and energy evolved to a higher order. That's so um, I, I like where Cliff is going with this. Um, if, if I were describing the soul as I understand it, um, in philosophy, uh, there's, there's a problem called the hard problem of consciousness, which uh, it's basically the question, why do we have... Uh, mental states if we are just brains or if we are um are if we are just our bodies which only have physical properties why do we have these weird like conscious states like uh thinking and feeling and having intentions and th those kinds of things those, they don't seem to be describable in terms of uh, scientific language so i think that's where cliff is going he's not going to go into like super detailed on that argument but i think that's his underlying assumption here um what they got say is uh when, when he says the soul is the person some people are might get a little confused by that because i think when people think of a person they think of the person that they're looking at and what is visible and what we experience of other people is um there we see their bodies right and um we know that they have uh biochemical processes that uh make them up um uh, but that's not what cliff means here by the person cliff means the uh the the substance that that persists over time and has experiences so we experience this in our in our own lives in our 
conscious life. The thing that is conscious is what is the soul. And I think that's how I would kind of describe it uh, versus just saying, you know, it's the, the person. But I, I, I like where, where Cliff is going with this. Do you guys have any, have any thoughts on that one? No, I just, um, I really like the way that he describes that, that if you do look at the world in a atheist's perspective, why is there, why is there a soul? You know, it's exactly like you said, we're, we would just be evolved from. Um, the police are not going to take your soul. Hopefully <laughs> by the, not. By the way. Yeah. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. They can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. They may take yeah. your pride. Or something like that. I, and I think it it, I it, it it is an interesting argument because it's it is counter intuitive I think if people think about it to like we're, we're kind of taught it seems like in our society that uh we are just our bodies we are just our brains and we're, we're taught all this amazing biology about how the brain works and, and everything but the most evident things in one's life in my opinion, are your conscious mental states. Those are the things that are like immediately apparent to you. You don't have to be taught about them, but you just experience them. And the, to me, that, that is difficult to fit within a materialistic worldview. I like how Cliff is saying, without the soul, we're almost just like walking flesh and bone. Yeah. So from, uh, I, don't, I don't know a lot about science, uh, I'm I'm trying to learn a little bit more, and it was cool like watching and listening to this. But it does kind of make sense. Like if if we don't have a soul, we're just walking flesh and bones, and like we don't really have a purpose per se. Like we're just chemicals that make up a human being. And I thought that was a good point that he made. Uh, that makes sense to me in that argument. Yeah, and I think the context of this discussion is going to go into what allows somebody to get into heaven and i I, cliff kind of reads that that what what logan is talking about is like is it if if we are like the sum of our experiences you know how how can we say that one person or, or another doesn't deserve to go to heaven if they can't even control like their their experiences and the effect that that has on their soul so uh yeah let's just see where where cliff goes with this discussion which means there's no soul, there's no you, there's no me. There's a complex chemical reaction in our brains that we call ourselves, but that's an illusion because the real you is simply a chemical reaction. Now, my experience of life says that's baloney. My experience of life says there is a real you. That's why I hold you responsible for the way you treat your mother, your friend, because I don't think you have to do what you do because you've been chemically programmed. Instead, you're a human being created in the image of God with a soul, which means a free will, the ability to love or to hate, the ability to forgive or seek revenge. You have a rational mind. You don't have to think a certain way. You don't have to believe something. You choose to. Well, the only reason why that can be real is if there is more to you than your complex chemical reactions. Mm. There's got to be a soul, a you, a me. But a me and a you is partially made up of our human experience. Exactly. So how much does a human experience play into what your soul becomes? You bet. All right, so if my dad had been an alcoholic, and you ask me, Cliff, why are you an alcoholic? And I say, well, because my dad was an alcoholic. And then I've got five younger siblings, none of whom are alcoholics, and you ask them, well, why are you not alcoholics? And they say, because my dad was an alcoholic. See, what we're getting at is, yes, we're all influenced by the environment we grew up in, no question about it. But then we choose what we're going to do with that environment. And I can choose to use my dad being an alcoholic to justify me being an alcoholic, or I can say, you know something? I'm never going to touch a drop of alcohol because my dad was an alcoholic mm-hmm. and I saw how destructive it was in his life. So we're still free, although we're influenced by our environment, but we're free. I don't have to love you. I can hate your guts. I don't have to forgive you. I can seek revenge. I don't have to do either. So um, I think somebody that's like a hardcore determinist is going to say, um, you know, the 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 difference between you and your father is still ultimately just up again, up, up to your, your biochemistry. Um, so I think that there are like cliff is still open to some counter arguments here, but I, I think that intuitively he's, he's making a pretty good argument for, um, what it seems to be apparent that we have uh, free will. And I think that free will is central to Christianity. There are these people named Calvinists or called Calvinists, 
we love them. They're Christians too, but they don't believe we have free will in the same sense that um, all of us in, in this room w- would believe. So we're not, sorry, Calvinists. We're not, we're not Calvinists here. Uh, but uh, do you guys have any thoughts about this, this clip? Yeah, I, I love how Cliff gives the example of talking about like his dad was an alcoholic and he, you know, the first example he says, why do you not drink? And he says, because my father did. And he gives the example of like the five younger siblings. No, he says, I, I do drink because my father did. And then the five younger siblings, they don't drink because his father did. And that just shows that right there we have every single one of us, as we know day to day, we have our own choices. We have free will to choose. And you can either decide from experiences like Logan brings up. He says like doesn't experiences make up who we are, which I, I do agree with too, like through our experiences that kind of, you know, makes us up as well. But we have that opportunity to choose either to go down the right path of, you know, like not drinking in that situation or down the wrong path of becoming alcoholic and drinking. And God gives us that free will, that free choice to, uh, you know, choose to love him, choose to follow him in his way, obey his commandments or the exact opposite and not follow him. I think that's really hard for non-believers, people that don't follow Christ of, of trying to understand what free will even looks like as a Christian or do we even have free will? So I think that's, I think it's a really tough one for someone to answer and for even for us to explain. I feel like there's been times in my life where I've had to explain how much free will that we actually have. And I I couldn't, I couldn't give a really good answer. So is, is there any way that you could like, yes, Brenda, I'll take this one. Shout out to Milo who kind of taught me this. And I think we've, I think we might've mentioned this on a previous podcast, but God is omniscient. He knows beginning to end. He knows the choices that you're going to make, but he does not control you like a puppet. So similar to how a parent... How do you know that? What's that? How do you know that? How do I know that God doesn't control me? Yeah. Because God hates sin. Makes that very, very clear that God is anti-sin. That was, that was the very first thing. He, he did not want us to sin, yet we choose to. So that idea that we can sin, but God doesn't want us to either means that God is evil and it's just, this is all just a trap or we have our own free will. So the example that I like to think about is a parent who knows their, and again, Milo taught me this one. So shout out Milo. And, and shout out Milo. I, I was taught by, you know, probably William Lake Greg or somebody. So it's not like I came up with this. Well, there's right. some Passing wisdom. down the wisdom. Yeah, exactly. There you go. There you go. Boom. Um, but it's, it's just how a parent knows their child so well that they know their child is going to touch like a hot stove and and get themselves hurt. Idiot. Exactly. (laughs) And I'm sure that's how God, maybe not that harsh, but he's like, he knows that you're going to sin. He knows you're going to do wrong, but he's not controlling you to do it. It's not like the the parent stuck the hand of the child on the um, hot stove because, again, that would would imply that God was evil. Can I... What also. about what about the idea of back to your question, Joy, is about how do we know that God's not control us like a puppet? So when we make decisions and I think we can all agree, when we when we help someone out, when we do something good, we help a friend, someone in need, we give a compliment, we we have that like good feeling that we deep down inside like we know that that was like the right thing to do. What about we do something bad or evil or sinful and we have that conscience that conscience that that guilty like afterwards knowing like even i I think even if you believe in in christianity or not in in christ that when you do something wrong you i think deep down you know that it was wrong and i think if christ did control us like puppets i don't think we would have that that guilty feeling of doing Mm. something wrong because if i think if we were being controlled to do everything in a particular way i don't think we'd feel that necessarily right but i could be wrong that's just my thought on that no absolutely i mean that that all goes into the aspect of when you were talking about even the concept of the hot stove of you know we have that choice that you know the kid could touch the hot stove or me or whatever and i'm gonna learn from that mistake and i'm gonna choose okay Last time I touched the hot stove, it hurt. So now I'm going to choose not to do that because it's going to cause me, it would otherwise it would cause me pain. 
And so like, it's the same thing with every interaction that going back to the experiences that make up what is our soul, what is our conscience of, you know, we choose to love somebody. We choose to hate somebody. We choose to, you know, not say this thing because the last time we said it to someone, it didn't go well for us or for that person or whatever it may be. So we, we, we learn off of that and we grow ourselves, whether whether good or bad. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah hopefully. That's, yeah, we, and that's the concept. We definitely fall back into those patterns. We, we keep touching the stove or we, we try to get too close to it. But I, right. I agree with you. In a, yeah, in a generalist aspect exactly. of like... You, you should grow and you should know, no, are we going to make mistakes? Yeah. But it doesn't mean that we don't have now that knowledge that like we can apply and like, oh yeah, that's right. No, duh. Don't touch the hot stove. Like, don't know why I did it, but you know, it's like now I know and I can apply that and you can apply that to any sort of concept when it comes to relationships, your job, anything. So... And just going back to arguments for free will or determinism, um, for, for one, these are philosophical discussions. So I don't think that free will or determinism can be proved scientifically. They're, they're ideas, um, they're concepts that are outside of the purview of science. What science can do is show like the, um, that it, it kind of like lessens the amount of free will that we apparently have like if you were to go back in the past um before they knew uh, more about like how the brain works and stuff like that um they they would they would have put a lot more emphasis on free will versus like either chemistry in your in your brain but i i don't think that science is ever going to prove with 100 percent certainty that free will doesn't exist and um i think that there's pretty decent philosophical arguments for why we have free will, but they are, they're all going to depend on your intuitions about things. So like one argument for free will is that, um, if, if free will didn't exist, we wouldn't have any moral culpability because we're all just determined by God or, you know, determined by our biochemistry or, or something. So the fact that we do think that we have moral culpability, like if, if I steal something, I did something wrong and I'm, uh, deserving of some sort of retributive punishment for it. Um, if you accept that intuition, then you should believe that there is free will because if there weren't free will, you wouldn't have that culpability. So that's that's like one type of argument that that uh, could be marshaled for free will. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, keep on playing the clip here. Is the essence of the soul the deciding factor? upon whether a person goes to heaven or hell or, 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 no. or, or what is, what, what is the decision? You, you and I will go to heaven because we choose to live our lives together with God. You're sure about me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> the comments are going crazy right now. Well, <laughs> Jesus promises you, Logan, eternal life. If you put your faith in him. Okay. And his resurrection from the dead points to him being reliable. He's not a quack. Mm. I mean, if Jesus had said, I'm going to die and then rise from the dead. And if he wouldn't have pulled it off, I would not believe in him. But the fact that he died and then rose from the dead mm. historically is solid evidence that he indeed is reliable. If you die and rise from the dead, I promise to listen very carefully to everything you have to say. <laughs> Jesus died, rose from the dead. That's why it's a no-brainer. you got to take him seriously. Well, dude, I've been on the road for ages. My they, they go into an ad here. So, yeah, I, I think um, one thing is Logan's kind of struggling with the idea that um, Christians believe that some people go to heaven and some people go to hell and people that are honestly um genuinely you know uh, living in another religion um and thinking that they're, they're living good lives uh christians believe that they they may not make it to heaven or they're it depends on which christian you talk to in my opinion they are uh less likely to make it to heaven but we can't say with certainty whether or not they that they will make it into heaven but uh, do you guys have any thoughts on that one? I just recently had uh, a discussion with my brother about that. Of His question was if someone had never heard of Jesus Christ or they were never shown who he was in some sort of fashion, like mm -hmm. who, like he believes that, that Jesus is a, is a loving God and he wouldn't turn away anyone 
it, as long as they live a good a good life, treat people well, like kind of like what Logan Paul was saying about like treating people the right way. And he he just believed that like God just isn't gonna turn away good people. And so I I just thought that was really interesting. It's a it's an interesting take, uh, but I I think ultimately Christ has has to be in that discussion in order to and I think that Christ shows himself to people in in different ways. So like people that live in you know remote areas of the world that may have not heard the name Jesus Christ. I think that God shows himself in different ways uh through nature through maybe i don't know i can't even think of anything else but other than that but like i don't know how god would show himself but if anyone has any i was oh uh, all you all you go ahead i'll go next uh, i was gonna say so i i like how you brought that up so first thing that comes to mind is we can see in the bible it gives examples i can't think off the top of my head exactly where in the bible right now but uh, I think that's one right I think there. That, right? Whoa, look uh, at that. Oh, dude, Romans so, Ro- yeah, Romans one twenty for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. So that's one of the one of the verses that's relevant to this discussion. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was gonna then go to say that Christ tells us to go to the ends of the, the earth, to all, all nations, all tribes, right? So we, we as Christians, it's our responsibility to not just keep that our faith to ourselves, but to, to tell people, to share with people, because how are supposed, people supposed to you know, like hear about or know if we don't you know, ourselves or have missionaries or people go share that? So I think, like you're saying, with people that are remote in tribes that maybe never heard the word of God, one that's like one way to do that is get missionaries out there. We go ourselves through prayer, but also I think God, we got to remember God is very just. He's very merciful and he's a fair God in his, not in our eyes fair all the time, but in his fairness that I think I we'll co- never know the, Oh good. I was like, we'll never know the answer. If someone is a good person of a good life and they've never heard the word of God, I, I have no idea if like what's going to happen to them when they die. And I think, like I said, God is very merciful. He's very just, and he's uh, he's a good God. Um, and I think he can work through dreams. He can work through visions, all those kind of things. And What about right. to the people that are good people, and they have heard of God but or Jesus, but they don't necessarily accept him as God? As <clears throat> a tough one, right, for like, sure. I've can, met a lot of great people yeah, exactly. who... I would love to say, you know, like with full certainty, like this person, I, I want them to go to heaven, obviously, because I want everybody to go to heaven. Um, but to know that they've chosen another religion, it's, yeah, that's something that I've struggled with in the past. And, and uh, I think it was Logan that, that talks about this, that some people, like you were saying, they're so devoted to the religion. And I, I think that is a very hard topic to like wrap my head around. But in the end, I think it breaks down to, you know, that is their choice. And I think there's more to it than just saying like, oh, I'm going to choose this instead. I think it's you not wanting to accept Jesus and God. God allows you to have what you want. And God then, after death, separates you from him because that's what you were essentially asking for, is that separation. You, If you don't want to accept the Christ God, then he's going to grant you that. It it is a tough thing. I I get where he's where Logan Paul struggles with that because we all know really really awesome people that aren't Christians and they do good in this world, and then and then we just tell them like oh like you you just don't believe this one thing so you don't get eternal life so like and I think that's where to sometimes swallow. we we have to step in you know I I I think about that too where I'm kind of like oh well. I don't want to be annoying, you know, I don't want to... It's in God's hands. Yeah, or I'm just like, I don't want to really, you know, be too, like, Christian-y around them or whatever. But it's like, dude, if the trumpets sound and Jesus returns, and what, are you going to stand before God and say, like, oh, sorry, I was just trying to find, like, a convenient time. 
you know, it's it's not a good enough excuse for us to to pass it off. So and I'm I'm guilty. There have been plenty of times where I'm like, I don't really want to talk about this because it's just very like uncomfortable. Like I know they don't believe in it. And so I'll just I'll just let it go. Um, mm-hmm. But let's yeah. let's yeah. play this next section. Okay. Um, I, I, Let me just prerequisite of acceptance of Christ into your to your heart and a continued path of, of following Christ as a as a way to uh, gain access to the kingdom of heaven. Um, are there any other prerequisites beyond that? Or on the flip side, what are, I, I don't, I don't think we really need to go over like mortal sins and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I kind of want to keep on this discussion going, which I think they pick up here. So the discussion about like, do, do non-believers go to hell? So I asked someone who it was pretty religious, uh, who's close to me. I asked, I asked, uh, this person, I said, um, so what about people who don't believe in Jesus, but are still extremely religious and they subscribe to Allah or uh, the Buddhist or mm-hmm. whatever, whatever the, the the deity is that they worship and believe in. And even just based on what you guys have told me today, if, 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 if that person doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, I said to this person, are they going to hell? Are they, are they doomed for the rest of eternity? The only reason people go to hell is because they choose to live their life separate from God. And Jesus? They, they, sorry. Yeah. In this from context, Jesus, from you- God, yep, correct. So if I choose to reject Christ and live my life separate from Him, I'm choosing to live my life separate from God, and I will, based on my decision, will spend eternity separate from Him. So you believe that anyone who doesn't accept Jesus Christ is, is going to hell? Anybody who hears about Christ and has the opportunity to investigate Christ by reading the Gospels and chooses to reject Christ, Jesus clearly said, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he's not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. That's what Jesus... So, right there, boom. Yeah, so that wraps it here up. Cliff is... Uh, he, he seems to believe that um, one of the prerequisites... For somebody going to hell if they don't believe in Jesus, like literally Jesus's name, like the 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 person that God, I mean God, but God's son that He sent down. If they don't believe in Jesus, the prerequisite is that um, they had to have not heard the name of Jesus or like been told the gospel before. Now, I, I I will say I don't think every Christian theologian believes that same thing, like. Uh, I'm sure there's theologians out there that that believe that um, even if you haven't heard the gospel, you are still going to go to hell uh, no matter what because you you haven't heard the name of Jesus, you haven't heard the gospel, um, and you are a sinful person that's rebelled against God, uh, and therefore you uh, are not going to go to heaven. In my Uh, opinion, that would just be unfair. And I think to me at least, I don't know. I'm I'm not God. I, I don't really know what his exact plan for all that is. I kind of agree with you, but I, 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 I'll steal man the case that they're, that they're making because (laughs) I just like, yeah, steal man man the case. So, um, the idea there is that, um, what is the reason why people go to hell? Because they haven't accepted Jesus as their Lord and savior. Right. But that's, that that's one of the conditions but the like the cause the thing that caused it is that they are sinful people that rebelled against god okay so they actively rebelled and are separating themselves from god even the people that haven't heard the gospel but do they know they're rebelling against god or do they just know they're doing the wrong thing yeah, so that 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 is the idea that's kind of hinted at here in Romans one twenty and in in other verses that we have that we have a conscience built within us that mm-hmm. God gives us a moral sense uh, that even people that haven't heard the gospel they know right from wrong to a certain extent they mm-hmm. might not know the details as laid out in the Bible but they they do know that murder is wrong or uh, you know whatever whatever sin it is that kind of goes back to like the soul thing like they they have a conscience like they know yeah they know what they're doing right yeah now i personally do think that there's a good case to be made that people that even that haven't heard the gospel 
um, could still respond to God in a in a way that you know they don't know about Jesus specifically, but they are still responding to Jesus by His revelation to them. I that's my personal belief. I think there's a good case to be made for that, but I'm not going to say that that's like absolute um, orthodox doctrine. Yeah, and like mm-hmm. like I was saying earlier, we don't we're never going to know, right? But we know that God is a fair and just God and he's loving and he's merciful and we pray that those people will you know come to Christ and come to know him uh whether that be you know right before their death or anything like that um I just want to say too really quick um what Logan and Paul was saying too about it it is hard to wrap your head around like knowing that there are people there's really great amazing people that do amazing things all the time for their community, for their family, for the world that maybe follow a different religion and maybe they never heard the word of God. And it's just such a, it's a difficult thing to like wrap your head around thinking that, you know, they follow a different God. That's not the one true God and that they may not be in turning with Christ. You know, like that's a very difficult thing. Like Logan's saying to wrap your head around, like, how is it that, you know, Someone can be a good person doing all these great things, even maybe better than a, a Christian that maybe is, you know, being a hypocrite or something like that, that says that they believe in Christ. But then there's going to be like that separation from Christ in the end. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. yeah. No, I, 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 you, you got something to say and then I'm going to move on to the Yeah, the absolutely. Well, and I, I, I think that's a great, you know, part that you bring up and what you brought up earlier about the Great Commission to go into all of the world you know, professing Jesus as Lord and baptizing everyone in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and bringing everybody back into the family to give them that knowledge of like, oh, God God does love me. And a great passage of scripture, if you don't mind me reading, that kind of helps explain this is uh, Romans 5, uh, 6. It goes through 11, um, but I can just do 6 through 8. Um It says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. So all of us, right? It doesn't matter who we are, what we've done, we're all ungodly. So he died for us. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Love that verse. Yeah, and like, it it just it helps to put it in perspective of like, God came in flesh and blood, was killed by His own creation, for us. That He died, so that we could be back with Him. He reconciled what is called the wrath of God, and so that's why I I believe that, you know, everybody will be will be judged just and fairly at the end of days whether or not they heard about the truth of truth of jesus christ and like ah that's that's a whole nother thing yeah um yeah just like i i truly believe no matter what whoever it is they're gonna be just they're gonna be judged justly and while that may be a hard pill to swallow that is why it is so incredibly important we know God can do miracles. We know God can work through dreams. I mean, there's hundreds of stories out there of people converting from Islam, from Zoroastrianism, uh, Buddhism, all, all these different religions from a dream of Jesus, you know, of them encountering Jesus and like full conversion right there. Like that, there are hundreds of stories out there, even thousands, but that is why Jesus makes it so incredibly important to fulfill the great commission and to go into all the world. I mean, just think we've been doing this for 2000 years. Jesus is giving us all the time in the world to go and do this, to make disciples of all nations. You know, if if, if 2000 years already is not enough time, like, you know what I mean? Like he's going to give us the proper amount of time. We got to figure it out. Yep. Okay. Good stuff. Let's uh, watch the rest of this clip. Jesus said, it just isolates such a large portion of the population. Good, good point. Jesus doesn't give his followers an option when it comes to loving people. 
If I'm a follower of Christ, I don't have an option to hate. I have to love. I have to accept. Mm. I have to be tolerant. So here, I, I, I kind of think maybe Cliff misinterpreted what Logan meant here. Because I, I think what Logan is saying is that like by isolating it, he, he means that um, it, it, it's like God is rejecting some people or that like just the idea that some people are not going to make it to heaven. Where Cliff is kind of saying like we shouldn't reject or isolate other people or not love them. But I, Logan's question is more just like a fundamental question about Christianity. I, I, let's keep on going, and then, and then we can talk about it in a second. And who, as he's bleeding and dying on a cross, prays for his enemies, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's the essence of tolerance. So intolerance, bigotry, hatred is not an option for a f genuine fall of Christ. But isn't intolerance sort of rooted in Christianity a bit? Okay, great question. This is a matter of truth. If I say to you, every religion leads to God, is that a truth claim? No. I would argue yes. What I'm saying is every religion leads to God, which means I contradict the Muslims, I contradict the Christians, I contradict the Jews. This is a truth claim. Okay. I, as a white Western male, am saying every religion leads to God. That's a truth claim. If I say to you, half the religions lead to God, is that a truth claim? Sure it is. I'm saying half are right, half are wrong. That's a truth claim. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, is that a truth claim? Yeah, it sure is. So I think what, what Cliff here is saying is that it, it, regardless of whether or not um, there is an exclusiveness built into Christianity, that, that Jesus is the one and only way, um, whether or not you like that idea or not, it, it matters, is it true? Because if it's true, then that is the way the world is. So I, I think that's where Cliff is going here. You see, Logan, we all make truth claims. Everybody does. If you're against racism, you're making a truth claim. If you're against sexism, you're making a truth claim. If you're for equal housing opportunity, you're making a truth claim. You better not be prejudiced against someone because of their ethnic heritage when you rent out your apartment. Mm. So everybody makes truth claims. So the question is, what is the evidence supporting the truth claim that you buy into? Mm. Oh, I'm agnostic, Cliff. I don't believe anything. I'm sorry. That's impossible. Because you have to make ethical decisions every day. Yeah. And the ethical decisions you make every day tattles what you really believe about reality. I'm sorry. you got to go to funerals. Got to. Your loved ones are going to pass. You don't believe it could be intuitive? This feels wrong. This feels right. Or socially programmed, as we, as we spoke about earlier. Okay, good. <clears throat> yes, society obviously impacts. But don't you and I have the utmost respect? I think the discussion kind of shifted here. Yeah, this part of it when I was watching, <clears throat> I wasn't satisfied with the way that uh, Cliff responded. I think mm -hmm. what he says is phenomenal, but I don't think it quite hits the head of what Logan is talking about. Yeah, because Logan has a problem with the exclusiveness, the exclusivity claims of Christianity. Yeah. How would you answer it? How did he phrase his question? He was just saying... It, um, he said, uh, "Isn't I, don't like, doesn't that exclude a large? Yeah, isn't like exclusion like population. a part of Christianity? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think what I do like about what Cliff says is it goes back to truth. It's mm -hmm. you know whether it's your belief or not. I mean, in my belief, that is the truth. Yeah, and the population they do choose to reject that, but that is still their." their free will. And again, yeah, like you said, I'm not a scholar, so I haven't studied this topic, you know, to a certain extent where I could give you a clear answer, but my response would just be that it, no, it, it comes down good. to truth. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think what, what kind of veered them off topic a little bit here was Cliff said um, that, uh, you know, you have to make truth claim decisions in your life and moral decisions. And then that got, got them thinking like, um, can't we make moral decisions intuitively based off of our own like conscience, which I agree with. I think, I think I don't believe you have to be a Christian in order to know right from wrong. That's actually a fundamental part of Christianity. That's a, a, a part of uh, Romans um, where it, it says that, you know, people are not, are without excuse. Um, so, yeah. I, <clears throat> when it comes to Logan saying that, excluding a large portion of the population 
like to me it makes sense like if if christianity was not true and there was some other religion that was that was the way that was the god to get you into eternal life the afterlife heaven like that would make sense but it doesn't make sense to me like having all these different routes of different beliefs different gods being like oh this you can do this and follow these rules or you can do this and follow these rules but you're still going to get to the same place the same heaven eternal life yeah like there's there's got to be in my mind like what i believe there has to be one way one thing that you believe in one thing that you follow in like think think about the gym for example if you go to the gym once a week you eat fast food all the time junk food uh do that's all me 100 percent. that's huge no i'm kidding <laughs> like you do all these things like going to the gym once the once a week is great sure but are you going to hit your goals for losing weight building muscle all those kind of things probably not but if you stay consistent and you follow the path of going to the gym regularly being consistent really getting on your grind eating healthy working hard while you're in the gym you're going to start seeing results that you wouldn't see if you were taking a different way to get there and that's just kind of the way that i see it. like there might be other avenues but there's one true way you know to to christ to eternal life through through christianity through jesus with some leeway though because we don't think that just one denomination of christianity Correct. like leads Correct. you to christ Correct. so we yeah. even believe in in multiple yeah. ways but they're all through jesus yeah i mean like there's yes there's hundreds not th- i don't know thousands of different denominations but it's like doesn't matter what denomination as long as christ is the center jesus christ dying on the cross for our sins you know giving us eternal life and us accepting that and following christ and following his commandments and you know better ourselves like that's the way to you know to god through jesus christ right there's a uh, I listened to uh, a sermon given by one of my favorite pastors of all time, Jonathan Pakluda. Um, I don't know if you guys know any of them. He was uh, kind of the lead pastor of the Porch Ministries uh, down in Texas, and now he leads a different church. But he ge- he literally gave a sermon specifically on this topic of, uh, but he gave it in the sense of an airport, and so he said. Uh, you know, I I have to get home to my daughter. Like, there's an emergency. Like, just get me on a plane that'll take me home. And he talks to like the 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 flight person, and they're like, "Dude, you can take any one of these planes. They'll all take you to to where you need to go." No, that's not true. They're not all gonna take me to where I go, where I need to go. They're gonna take me this way, and this one's gonna take me that way. Sure, could I take a connecting flight and take me home? Sure, but no, there's one right way. There is run plane that is going to take me from where I am right now to where I need to go. And he does a way better job explaining it than I do. And so, uh, for those of you that are listening that want to hear uh, an in-depth sermon on this topic, um, I highly encourage you to go uh, listen to that by Jonathan Pakluda. Um, he, he just, he details it so great of just like, if like kind of like the essence of like a truth claim. Like if every way let us go home to where we need to be, which is heaven, the end all be all place. Like then what's the point? I like that analogy. That was really good. Mm -hmm. For Abraham Lincoln, for Gandhi, who choose to follow their conscience instead of following the status quo. Mm. Don't we really respect people who say, you know something? There's a lot of social pressure on me to go this way. But I'm not going to go this way because I have a rational mind. I've got a conscience, and I'm going to think through this issue, and I'm going to do what I believe is best. Well, we 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 also appreciate those people. Got to. Your loved ones are going to pass. You don't believe it could be intuitive? This feels wrong. This feels right. Or socially programmed, as we as we spoke about earlier. Okay, good. Yes, society obviously impacts. But don't you and I have the utmost respect for Dr. Mark? Lincoln for Gandhi, who choose to follow their conscience instead of following the status quo? Mm. Don't we really respect people who say, you know something, there's a lot of social pressure on me to go this way, but I'm not going to go this way because I have a rational mind, I've got a conscience, and I'm going to think through this issue, and I'm going to do what I believe is best. Well, we, all, we, we also appreciate those people, like, given, yes. you know, us, the four of us, you know, yes. white American men in 1950, yes. right, or yep. 19. 19- 
56. Like, who knows what our... Is that somebody's gonna kill me on this date? No, we're just day for what? Uh, for MLK, are we close? Yeah, yeah. Are we close? Yeah. At least fifty six. Right. Does that yeah. work? Yeah. Who knows what our our thoughts about his speakings would have been at, at, at that given time? Be, which is which I'm bringing back. And by the way, obviously coming from a Christian, this is just a uh, an exercise here yeah. of you know like what what say you to these people who believe that some of that ethic ethical behavior and moral behavior. Uh, is just a socially programmed belief set from their existence on this planet. I think we've we've spoken about this a little bit today. You bet. Well, it depends how you view the human being. If a human being is simply the sum total of the influences of their environment, we're not free. We've been programmed by our environment. Now, I agree environment has a powerful influence. I think that's obvious. I'm dressed the way I am because I grew up in the United States. So I've been influenced by my culture, by my society. Connecticut. <laughs> to be honest with you, that's, you yeah, can, trust me, I would still be rocking both of these fits if I hadn't moved to LA. I, when I met Logan, I was wearing that exact same outfit. Yeah, I swear. But I don't think I have to follow my environment. Right. And I think there are more than enough examples from all four of our lives that at times we've followed our environment and at times we've contradicted our environment. But I, th I think you hit something different. So you hit social, you hit instinctual. Mm. And I go by evolutionary theory. You know, I believe in evolution, evolution, micro. Wait, what? A lot of Christians don't. Yeah, wait, whoa. Well, you're, so morally, you should be at the top of the food chain. You're a fighter, right? You've got power. You know, the, the powerful, they eat the weak, strong eat the weak. His record is. And so why is one that? One and one. <laughs> so I don't know. So why is, you know, might makes right <laughs> from an evolutionary perspective. Why do we as a society don't just say, you know, why would you live for something like human rights? Why would you disadvantage yourself for the poor? You know, from an evolutionary standpoint, you should slaughter them or at least just let them die off. Why would, you know, if you have your, your baby, not, not, not back to your baby. No, go ahead. Perspective. Go ahead. Slaughter my unborn baby, God. <laughs> so bad news, Logan. Unfortunately. God. For, the, for the listeners, they, they talk about killing Logan's unborn baby like multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> it's the whole topic of moral to <laughs> The moral percentage was astronomical back in the Roman Empire of those who, if you didn't like your baby, you just throw, threw it on a trash heap. You know, Jeez. infanticide was all of, well, that fits with evolution. It totally does. It does, it does actually. Yeah. yeah. And so why morally, instinctually, like you're saying, if we just were raised red and tooth and claw, just live that way. Like Hitler lived that way. It makes sense to me. Hey. So if there is no God, I hate to say this. Like, I don't mean to get dark real quick. But if there is no God and there is no Christ, I would try and be as consistent as possible with that worldview. Fair. That makes sense. I want to pin the evolution. That surprises me that you believe in evolution. Um, pin that. Uh, what were we just... Oh, oh. I wanted to touch on the intolerance part of just... Not even, not even just Christianity. Just organized religion in general. This is a qualm I have. This is, this is where I think if, if again, this is where you got heated. I, I have, got I harbor resentment for certain parts of organized religion that make people either exclude others or lead to hatred and, and, um, dispute rage feud. I, 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 and, and in this particular podcast, actually, I had a moment where I was like mocking religion and Jesus in general. And by the way, the next three months of my life were hell and like like literally i felt the wrath of god like it, instantly instantly um and i had to sit there and watch and i'll never do it and i'll never do it, like, dude, never do it again and, th and then by the end of it i had like my like it wasn't like a come to jesus moment but he definitely gave me guidance in a time where i needed guidance anyways that was a verbal outpour of like a level of resentment that i felt for certain parts of particularly in that scenario christianity that i just didn't agree agree with um Man, like I, I, I'm just, I'll be honest here. I don't love the sort of like exclusive club feeling. Oh, you can get into heaven if you believe in Jesus, but everyone else is doomed. I don't, I don't, I don't love that. Right. Because there are people who, who have the same amount of faith in their religion as you guys do in yours, who are putting their time, effort, energy, investing their whole lives into believing in a deity. And like, according to you guys, you know, they won't end up in a place uh, that is paradise, even though they're leading a great life and have a great moral compass. Um, even, even just like, even like, you know, the whole like gay marriage thing, like, I, I, like, correct me if I'm wrong, right, right. But according to Christianity, like gay marriage isn't allowed to be a thing. And I, I know there's a lot of circumstances of, um, like, a, a, a gay child being 
uh, resented and even alienated from their family because they have super religious parents. And I, and I hear those stories and like, I hurt, I hurt for those people because a decision is being made based on, um, uh, a set of beliefs that, the, that people are so bound to, mm-hmm. but then they throw the love aside for someone in their family. Yep. And, 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 and that, that kind of bothers me. Sure. But remember Logan, the legitimacy of faith is not determined by passion. If you're passionate about thin ice on a lake, I really believe this thin ice is going to hold me up. That doesn't matter. Yeah. You walk out on that thin ice, you're going through, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So the legitimacy of faith is determined by the trustworthiness of the object of your faith. If it's thick ice and you believe just a little and you step out on that ice, it's going to hold you up. Mm. You see, remember, I'm not, go- I'm not going to heaven because I'm passionate. No. I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. Christ died on a cross for me. I have put my faith in him. I doubt, man. I sin every day. I am no perfect human specimen. I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. That's who I am. Wait, I, Cliff, well, you keep saying that, but like you're, you're, I don't know you that well, right? So in my head, you're like painting a picture of someone that I like. I just don't believe you are. Is that you being humble? Are you are you like a really? Right, are right. you actually like a dirty rot? Probably right. his sin right. might be different. It comes than down that. to how you define sin. <laughs> no, I have never, not even date, but I have lusted. <laughs> no, <laughs> I have never murdered anybody, but I have hated. No, I have never brought a whip down on the back of a black slave, not once. But I, as a white American, have had subtle racist attitudes. No, I don't live an incredibly opulent life, but I have been greedy. So I'm not this wonderful person that I wish everybody would believe that I am. I am a sinner. That is why I need Christ. Now, remember, it's not about my passion. It's not about... So we can pause it here. Um, I I think that this is a really interesting interaction because this is how, like, a mature Christian talks. They'll, They'll talk about themselves as... Like they, a guy like Cliff has come to the realization of how sinful he is, despite the fact that the world doesn't see him as that sinful. You know, they they don't see him as like a, uh, I don't know, I don't, I, I don't I, you might have to bleep it out, but a a, a a German certain dictator that we know. I don't know if we could say that. Adolf Hitler. Or they don't see <laughs> Cliff ne- connectedly as Adolf Hitler. I was gonna say an Italian dictator too. Yeah, Italian, but... you know, Russian, whatever. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a few of them. Um the world doesn't see Cliff connectedly like that, but as it, it, somebody that's so mature in Christianity like Cliff, he he recognizes that um sin starts with your heart and starts with your intentions. And um Every one of us has an Adolf Hitler in us. It, 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 we, we can all become like that, but it starts with our intentions. And um, we are all sinful monsters, but sin is ultimately at the base, your intention and your, and your, your, um, your thoughts before you take any action. So that, that might be something that's like counterintuitive or... Um, um, yeah, not intuitive to a non-Christian. No, and, and and that's a good point. Um, I think what I got out most out of this conversation that they're having is the fact that Logan sees Cliff not as this terrible person, and what that is, I think that's that's evidence of one that Cliff is is truly a follower of Jesus and he has the Holy Spirit living in him, helping him to make good decisions and helping him to avoid certain sinful desires and all those other things. And therefore helping to witness Jesus to others. I think that's the kind of the main, the main aspect that I got out of it is like, you know, yes, as a mature Christian, we should be so keen to um to to recognize that we are very sinful and we're going to do our best to obviously try not to be sinful that's the whole process of sanctification and choosing to follow after jesus and in doing so we'll be witnessing to others and i think that's you know the mission and 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 people are able to see little bits of jesus 
in us. While we still have those sinful tendencies that lead us, that could, if we gave into it, lead us down a horrible dictator ass, uh, um, esque, sorry, <laughs> not ask, esque. Um, hey, now. Come on. Um, I, <laughs> that was bad. Um, dictator esque mm-hmm. mindset. Yep. Instead, we choose to follow the Jesus mindset and therefore trying to be the light of the earth, the salt of the earth as well. Really quick, I, I got to get this off my, my mind. They don't notice how massive Logan's arms are. Yeah, that's <laughs> huge. Mm-hmm. 22 every time, huge. Every time, yeah. every time I'm looking at He's those like, yeah, dude, video, like, just, what do you think? His biceps are like going to jump out of his shirt and mm-hmm. the screen. And yeah. Things. 24 He's inch built, pythons. And He's I built. like, I think it's always entertaining when people feel like they can't swear around Cliff and Stuart. I think it's really entertaining. Like they'll, Didn't Cliff just swear yeah. there? Yeah, they bleeped it out. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> but like, what you just who's, said, who's the, uh, the co host with Logan? Mm-hmm. What's his name? Mike. 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 When Mike like swore oh, like yeah, that yeah. earlier, and then he just like yeah. tries to cover it up and like yeah. apologizes. <clears throat> they just feel like uncomfortable mm-hmm. yeah. swearing in front of him, even though they don't really care. Yeah. yeah. Kind of right. Funny. Well, and I think that's that, that's that whole aspect of witnessing for Jesus. Like, they feel like, compelled when they're around somebody to maybe not act the way that they typically correct would. yeah and that's very difficult in this world i like that you bring that up because a lot of times that comes across as judgmental doesn't it yeah like i have been in scenarios where i am in an environment where maybe people are uh having a few having a few drinky poos or something you know and and the <laughs> and the environment you know they're drinking a lot of drinky poos and it can be or destructive smoky poos. yeah and <laughs> When I choose not to engage in that, I come across as judgmental. And it's like, it's very difficult because I'm like, I am not being judgmental. I'm just choosing not to make the same decisions. And like, if you want to do that, like, that's your life. I'm not saying like, oh, you know, you're going to hell for that. Like, you're not going to hell for that, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think I think when, sometimes when people are around, people like Cliff maybe, I know it's a little bit of a different thing, swearing, drinking, um, but you almost feel feel that like um conviction maybe and i think that's why sometimes people feel uncomfortable because it feels like conviction Mm -hmm. all right so we're gonna just uh finish up this clip here and then see if we have any other thoughts and we're gonna move on to um some other topics that they went over it's the key issue when it comes to faith it's about the reliability of the object of my faith and you know that if you trust a criminal he's gonna rip you off Mm. if you trust a reliable person that's good. Mm. Now, here's where it really gets tricky. Let's be a skeptic, right? Let's doubt. Okay, let's start right in here in this room. I doubt you and I doubt you. I oh, doubt man. me too. All right. I think I doubt him. Now, there's nothing wrong well. with doubting. I doubt myself enough for all of us. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> but, but, but I can push that too far. I can get to the point where I say, in spite of the evidence that you two guys are reliable, I'm not going to trust you. I'm going to be a hyper skeptic. Skepticism is good. But when it turns into hyperskepticism, watch out. Why is it so dangerous? Yeah, why? Because I'll never have the privilege of being your friend. If I'm always skeptical about you, if I'm always doubting you, I will miss my friendship with both you and you and that's, him. That's, but that's an extreme. You know, you, like hyper, hyper skepticism. Right? Sure, I, don't sure. think it, I don't know if it's as extreme as you think. This is the person I was describing before. This, I'm so smart because I question everything. The issue with these people is you provide absolute proof that their questioning is leading them down the wrong path, and they're still unwilling to accept that as a as a proof point. H- so, hyper skepticism, sure, just, but like call me just, more just, prevalent. Just, just to question and doubt and 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 not accept everything you see at face value as truth. I don't think. Do I don't think Jesus it. said you better do that. Oh, he did. He said, "Beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. Inwardly, they are ferocious wolves, and they will eat your lunch." Okay, let me tell you something about what you just said, mm-hmm. and this is where a portion of that resentment. So um, they're talking about skepticism here. They're going to go into um, an experience that Logan had where um, somebody might, I I don't know who it was, but um, somebody said that the reason why what what happened to him happened to him is because he had like um, a Buddha or something in his backyard. A a Buddha statue. Yeah. Yeah. He just got it. He just got it because he thought it looked cool. Yeah. I don't don't think we have to go into that one. Like, obviously we, we... we would all agree that we, that wouldn't be the right thing to say because who knows 
why anything happens to you. We don't, we're not in the mind of God. We don't know like if it was that statue or something like that, that, that caused it. It could have been a million different things. Um, it's just sinful nature in general. Yeah. Read Job. Like it could have been a conversation God had with Satan. We don't know. So, uh, but yeah, I don't think we have to go over that. What do, did you guys have any thoughts on that? Like the part about skepticism or questioning? I think it's important. I think it's, I think it's important that if we're not questioning our, our faith is going to diminish. It's going to mm. deplete. If we're not questioning if we're not curious shout out crossway community for the curious um yeah buddy it's also because i work there anyways uh if we're not questioning we're not going to grow if we're not choosing to seek out and to learn and to and to wrestle with things how are we going to grow if we're not choosing to work out those those faith muscles in a sense right they're not going to build those faith muscles. We're not going to build a better foundation with Christ. And that kind of goes back into wisdom, like last podcast, that mm. you need to seek that out and find that. And God, who is um, loving, he will provide you with that knowledge. Because if you stop at, Jesus died, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. You, I'm not saying that you're not going to heaven. You, you probably will. If, if you believe that in your heart, but you need to really reflect on what that means and then also say if you believe that Jesus is your hero, is your superhero that saved you from death, you need to look into what he has to say. Not just about the resurrection, not just about um, yeah, dying, resurrecting, so that we have resurrection as well in eternal life, but the teachings that he had. We need to question that as well and and seek that out for ourselves because if we simply sit at that we're not advancing in our on our faith and even just in our personal lives the things that jesus said on the sermon on the mount are revolutionary it i mean it's probably the most famous speech in history with how many moral values he covers in just those three chapters and so i think following those teachings is just so important for wisdom mm -hmm. and i think off what you're saying, Brandon, is that's why it's so important. Like, if you have your doubts, if you do your research and look into it, like, that's one reason why we started this podcast. Like, if we didn't truly believe or care or have questions, like, there's so many things that go over my head that I still don't understand. And I'm continuing trying to learn. And hopefully, everyone who's viewing gets something out of these podcast episodes as well. But if I were to be following a different religion, like I would hope that I would do my research. I'd look into it. I have my questions and I know I need to do look into more and understand more about different religions. But as a Christian, as Christians here, like we need to make sure that if we do have questions, we have our doubt, like that's okay. Look into it, do more research. And like you said, Brandon, you know, it's more than just saying some words, accepting that Christ is your savior, he died on the cross. It's pursuing after him and wanting to learn more. I, I do want a hug, actually. <laughs> that was awesome. That, that was, was really, cute. That, that was, was adorable. Really, thank you. We're not cutting that. Good. Mm -mm. Hey, science proves that uh, to be a functioning, re relatively happy person, you need four hugs a day. Relatively happy. Really? Four, four hugs a day. Four? Four? From four, four separate people? Three. Joey, I no, need four just hugs four, right now. Four hugs. Three a day. Well, what if you... It's got to be four different people, I feel like. Mm -hmm. No, nope. it doesn't have to be. Can you hug yourself? No. It's fire. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Sorry. Let's, let's nice. move on let's... to this next discussion, which is uh, it's going to be about uh, meaning in life. Ooh, good. And it needs to be. That's why I hold you responsible and you hold me responsible for what I do, for what I say. Because you know I don't have to do it. It's not a script. Exactly. It's not a script. This whole idea that God writes on a piece of paper, which you and I are going to do tomorrow, locks it in a bank vault, and then you and I have to do what's written on the paper. That's determinism. That's fatalism. No, 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 no. No, we're human beings created in the image of God, which means God partially limits his power by giving us a free will, and then we choose what we do. But God does hold us responsible. And that's why I love what you pointed out about the importance of responsibility. But you know, Logan, you, you and Jesus are, I think, a little closer than you would, might realize when you oh, talk man, about justice. That's going to get clipped up, man. Okay? That was, justice. That's going everywhere. <laughs> the reason is, the reason is, 
Why? So this is this is they're continuing the discussion about um, a free will and and um, Cliff's going to relate that to morality here, I believe. Why did Christ die on a cross? He didn't die on a cross because God is lovey-dovey. He died on a cross because God is just. And because God is just, the penalty for evil is death and hell. And Christ went to the cross, paid that penalty. Why? Because God's lovey-dovey? No, because God is just. The penalty for human evil must be paid. Oh, that's not cool. That's not cool. Oh, that's very cool. I understand you're an expectant father. A little yeah. baby coming into the world? Little baby Your girl. Your mom was bragging to me about it. Yeah. Little baby girl. <laughs> Sounds good. Yep. All right, Logan. Now, let's talk theoretically. Okay. Let's say somebody murders that little baby. God oh, damn it, Cliff. <laughs> I didn't even get a chance to do anything. <laughs> I didn't even make no! one video. I, I believe this is the first time they mentioned that, but it, it's a, like a recurring yeah. three. At thing least like five podcast. times, I think. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, I really shouldn't be laughing. That's they horrible. Just keep going. But he just, it's so blunt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder if that's the first thing that Cliff thought of. When he, found out that <laughs> he was thinking that the entire yeah. time. Oh, yeah. He started the podcast. 100%. He had it in his notes. Mm -hmm. It's Cliff notes. Good response, what a slogan. Horrific. <laughs> Al, I wasn't expecting this. Cliff, All right. Mom, Good dude. response. Yo, that's the hook. Pick sorry, the Grandma. <laughs> Yo, sorry, Mom. Ex -grandma. She, she didn't make it. <laughs> Damn, dude. Okay. I love your response. What? Why? <laughs> because you know very well. That if the police or the judge lets that dude off scot-free, your baby does not matter. Hmm. Now, what's fascinating is the way so many secular people will say, well, God's just love, so there's going to be no judgment. Really? So God doesn't judge the guy who murders my child? That's a clear statement on God's part. Your child, Cliff, does not matter to me. Therefore, I will not judge the guy who murdered your kid. Well, let's get one thing straight. God doesn't care about your kid. Your kid does not matter to God, and that's a lie. Jesus said, no, God does care about every single one of us, which is why when we hurt each other, when we hurt each other, when we cut each other off at the knees, God will judge us for that because he loves us because we matter to him. Does that make any sense? So um, I think I, it, Logan's problem with Christianity is more about um, the exclusivity claim of Christianity and... Uh, what he perceives as bigotry in, in Christianity. But uh, what Cliff is giving a really good argument against like a moral relativist here, somebody that, that doesn't uh, believe there's like objective moral values. And what's interesting with a lot of those people is they usually don't live as if there is no moral values, like what Cliff is saying here. Like if somebody were to murder your baby. N most Most people, even if they think that uh, morality is just subjective and just something that we make up in society. They they still will think uh, that somebody d is doing something very wrong if they do something horrific like that. So I think that this is a kind of a really good way to like come at that problem and explain God's nature at the same time. Yeah, I, there's a uh, I know I know you know the name of him. I I can't think of it off the top of my head. He's like the biggest atheist like um, Richard Dawkins Rick, Richard Dawkins I knew you're gonna know it uh, he even he talks about like yep nope everything's object uh, you know objective nothing subjective um, but even he constantly calls out different things and says like oh nope this is bad you're you're a bad person if you do this or you're bad well that's subjective that's not objective so that you're not you, then you're not truly being fully 100%, you know, objective on things. He He's making truth claims, in a sense, like yeah, if Cliff I, was saying. If I remember correctly, I think Richard Dawkins even says, like, the God of the Old Testament is a tyrant and evil. And it's like, that doesn't fit with your worldview, man. Yeah. That's like, that, that if, if we are just all um, chemicals, he has a really good quote. Um, I'll see if I can find it later. Yeah. But it's, it's basically, like... Uh, where there is no good or evil, we all, we all just dance to the, the music of our DNA, Some, something to that effect. And um, it's like, yeah, that's a, that's a contradictory stance there. You got, like, if you believe in good or evil and then believe in this materialistic sort of universe, they, they don't fit. But I, I, since we're talking about Logan Paul in this podcast, I don't think that that's where Logan is coming from. I think he's coming from just a, a doubt or problems that he has with, with 
Christianity on the exclusivity aspect. I think it's really cool too, just overall with this podcast in general, like we highly encourage you, anyone watching or listening to this, like go and watch this full episode with Logan Paul. It's a really good episode. I, I love and appreciate how Cliff and his son Stuart are so just like they know the wisdom that they have, the knowledge, and also just how they can have conversation with people and answer things and give different perspectives. But um, I lost where I was going to go with that. I think what's interesting about this is <clears throat> every, if you're not a Christian, maybe you do see that um, you know you have you have flaws, but you you you. St- have this idea like oh i'm a i'm a pretty good person because i've never killed someone or i've never like um forced myself onto somebody so yeah. keep it clean yep mm-hmm. um <clears throat> but when you study christianity and you you really peel back the layers we are very sinful you know like like logan paul is saying he's like I, I can't imagine that you're a you know you're a very bad person but we all envy others we're we're not content with the lives that we have and we want what other people have. We're prideful sometimes where we look down on people and say, I'm, I'm better than them. We lust over people and we, we think that we have the right to like have those thoughts about that person that we see. You know, there are so many other sins too that I could go into that we are very, very sinful in our nature and there is a punishment for those crimes per se. Like there, there does need to be a punishment. And so when you believe in Jesus Christ, he is that punishment. He, or he absorbed that punishment so that we don't have to. I think that's the biggest thing about Christianity is people, they, they don't like Christianity because there's all these rules, there's all these regulations they have to follow. But Christianity is a very, it is a very loving um, religion. And the very fact that Jesus had to come down and suffer and die and then raise again shows that God is just, exactly what Cliff is saying, is that the blood needs to be shed because we are sinful people. But Jesus said, let me take it so that they can make it to heaven. And the, the crazy thing too about that, like what you're saying, Brandon, is like how Cliff was saying, like I may not have done this, but I do this. Whether we are on the spectrum of murder, uh, thief, rapist, um, whatever it is, the high evil things that we can do as humans in this world or on the other spectrum, like Cliff is saying, you know, the normal day-to-day things that might not be in society as bad. Like the crazy thing about grace is God forgave everything from the most evil of things to the smallest of things and everything in between. And that's the thing that's just so crazy and incredible about grace is God looks at us and he loves us no matter what we do and he gives us the opportunity not saying that we should do those bad things. We want to do our best to strive to be like Christ, but everyone has the opportunity to turn, repent from those things, and God still loves you. He still accepts you, and he still wants to have eternity with you. Mm-hmm. And that's the amazing thing, too. And we don't have to worry about, I have to follow X, Y, and Z. We want to try to do that, but God is still going to accept us if we're willing to follow after him. Yeah, yeah. And, okay. and who else... Who else is like that? No human. And in other religions, like, um, I'm going to get it mixed up, either, either Buddhism or Islam, where if you do wrong, you know, you're going to come back as like a bug Hindu, or something. Like that. That's Hindu. Yeah, that's Hinduism. That's Hinduism. Hinduism. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know my religions very well. But, you know, with Christianity, it's you can do these wrong things. You can mess up. But God isn't going to condemn you to becoming a dung beetle or something. Because he lost, he he sent his son, which that would suck, by the way, to be a dung beetle, bro. Like it's like from Ice Age. I don't know if you see. But that if you were, yeah. if you were a dung beetle, you wouldn't. Think I wouldn't even be yeah. conscious. You just roll around it, some right? dung would yeah. be great. Yeah. But then you'd be like killed. And, like they're actually days. super strong. Could I, could I have that in the way? water? Um, like a water underneath there. I don't know. You need a water bottle. I need some water. A good, uh, mm-hmm. a good concept. I think that if there's Thank anything you. that like <laughs> you guys want to take away for a visual is uh i got it um sin is sin and 
because we are people, because we can have subjective opinions and whatever. <laughs> such a just complicated... drink it. <laughs> just drink it, dude. God. I'm so oh, bad at doing that. Every Me time too. I do it, I spill it, it. it. every oh, time. I just want to dump All it on you, Milo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Put it on the horn. No, it's like, let me give you Bring a really back. nice representation. Milo's just. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's, it's like, okay. <laughs> He's like Shook. dying over there, just so thirsty. Remember that scene I where Michael Salmonella. Scott? I don't know why this thirsty. reminded me of it, but when Michael Scott is like trying to like tie a knot of like a cherry, he's like date Mike, and he's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he starts like choking. <laughs> anyway, uh, go ahead. No, no, you're good. That was that was funny. Um, so a good a good concept is we see sin as like different towers. So murder up here. You know, <laughs> murder, <laughs> murder. Gosh, my <laughs> accent. Murder. <laughs> murder. I'm so murder. sweaty. Big, murder. Big, what? Big, I'm big, so big, sweaty big, too. Me too. Right. <laughs> it's yeah, it's 79 it's degrees in yeah, here. That's really warm. That's how many, how many more clips do we actually. have? How much longer huh? are we playing? Yeah, <laughs> do we take a break? Uh, we can... Just, do we have one? We're at about an hour twenty. An dude. Hour twenty. So I don't know if we want to finish just with one more clip and wrap it up. Um, All right, one more I'm clip. Just, okay. Let's do it. Wait, ah! I was in the middle of my explanation. All right, finish up the explanation. All right, I'll just go real quick. <laughs> we see sin on. as like different levels. So we have murder. I said it better. Uh, like rape, whatever, all the way up here, and then like stealing is down here, and then whatever. But God sees it from the top view. All of it's the same. Doesn't matter. It's just However, online. there are different consequences to those that may, how do I say this, collide with your beliefs with Jesus. I absolutely believe it with Wait, what are you're you, saying. Are you saying like all sins are equal? Yeah, from uh, God's perspective, yes. Sin yeah, is no, sin. I don't you're, agree with that. I, I mean, I do believe that sin is sin. I believe that, you know, if you were to ha tattle on somebody, or I don't know, you, you tell a white lie to your parents, th that is sin, and so is murder. Now, Murder affects so many more people, and I think it does pull you away from your relationship with God. I think it's very difficult to go out there, take somebody's life, and then say, I'm a believer in Christ. I believe that God died for my sins. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible. I, I watch, I don't know if you guys ever watched the Dahmer series, but at the end of it, he, he apparently, supposedly, allegedly, he got baptized. <laughs> allegedly. Allegedly, he got baptized and potentially repented and i don't know maybe he'll be in heaven i don't know i'm not saying i'm not saying that he did or didn't but when s just going back to what i'm saying like a white lie to a parent has a lot less consequences that may not affect your relationship with christ or that path that could lead you to christ as killing or forcing yourself on somebody i'm curious to know I, what so, think really but but the should... then the effect of grace is irrelevant no, no, no. I, I, I don't think so. I don't because... think so. Because like I said, somebody like Jeffrey Dahmer could be forgiven by God, even though he committed that sin. But I think that there are a lot more people that have told white lies to God that can make it into heaven than there are murderers that make it into heaven. I think what we need to take it really, we'll really quick, get back to the clip mm -hmm. to wrap it up mm -hmm. a little bit. But we need to bring it back to the beginning of Adam and Eve. So I think what we do know is God created us, and the penalty of sin is death, right? Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So as soon as we sin, whatever kind of sin it is, it doesn't matter if it's the worst of the worst or a small white lie, our penalty is death. And God dies on the cross. He gives us eternal life. I do think that with um, like the seven deadly sins, I think there might be kind of like what you guys are talking about. There yeah. might be things that were judged worded but that are a little bit more like leveled with that yeah. but we're never really gonna necessarily truly know because we're I not know, God it, and it that's, it back that's a big thing sin. I want to know I, I, don't I agree know. like I think that a any sin is is a prideful rebellion against God and that it's it it, it if you are rebelling against God then you are actively um, separating yourself from God and hell is where you're going to go yeah um, but I don't think that every sin is equal I, I just I, I don't see that from the Bible. I don't see that from the Old Testament. God reacts to different sins differently. Uh, the seven, seven deadly sins is an example. And intuitively, the conscience that God gave us tells us that not every sin is equal. There, there's the Holocaust, and then there's a white lie. Like there's there's different levels. So I can agree with you on on 
on one aspect, but I disagree on on another. Mm. Fight. <laughs> it's not a, no, that's why it's we have not a fight. No, We're just we having a conversation. We've had this discussion this. before. No, yeah, no. Yeah. yeah. We just um, see things and that's, a little different. And that kind of yeah, goes right. back to what we were saying, that even though we have differing beliefs, we still have that core value yeah. right. of, of exactly. Jesus' sacrifice. Do we want... Uh, yeah, we did you have another there. clip you want to go yeah, over? We're at about an hour 20. Do you want to reset the thing? It's at 40 minutes. No, I think it's okay. Okay. We'll make it a... We'll make it a yeah, we'll just, uh, quick, we'll just yeah, quick, quick we'll conclusion and we'll wrap it up. Okay. Mm-hmm. What I am looking for and what I have always struggled with is like the proof per se. Like I haven't really had like a come to Jesus moment that I know some people people have had. I haven't had and have abided by the guidance of the Bible to lead me to like a happy, successful place in my life. I just try to be a good person. I try to work hard and I try to love the people around me as much as I can. And by the way, I f- up a lot, but I, I guess like I started by saying, I'm just like unwilling to subscribe to a religion because then I guess this leads into this conversation. Why Christianity? There's so many denominations out there and to be able to like put your foot down on one, especially when they all have such positive teachings for the most part it's just so hard for me I, I i just don't know if i'm willing to make that assertion just yet so why christianity you is bet. the question all right first of all you're right i can't prove god but logan i think you've got god bearing down hard on you through your mom i think it's real clear that your mom loves you is that true mom <laughs> She she holding the cross. He at least get a so, thumbs up. Um, Cliff, she is holding the cross. I, I, Cliff, I don't think he. I, the first time I listened to this, I thought he misinterpreted Logan's question. But then he goes into evidence for Christianity. So, but Logan's not asking like proof for God because I think Logan believes in God. But, he does. He does think yeah. he, he says in God. for Christianity for Christ. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. So he's like why? Why he's asking why Christianity? So I I get where where Logan is going here. That um if if uh. God doesn't exist, then objective moral values doesn't exist. But love exists. You have the love of your mom. You know this is evidence that that God exists. I get where he's going there, but I don't know that that was uh, what what Logan was asking. Up or something. She just holds up, she holds up the cross. She's like, All right. men can't discuss the love of Logan. But here's a cross. I do love Jesus. I don't think that your mom's love for you is simply a chemical reaction. I think your mom has made a decision over the, your entire life to care for you, to provide for you, to protect you, to sacrifice for you. Mm. That is far beyond an animal instinct. That is a free decision your precious mother has made to really love you, to really care for you. Love, the experience of love, points us to reality, including some type of God. Okay, then the next question is, yeah, but who is this God? And that's where Jesus Christ, Muhammad, Confucius, Buddha, Siddhar. So here he goes into it, like an argument for, for Christianity. Come in, all claiming to be revealing God accurately. Mm. But the historical evidence is Jesus lived a sinless life. He never sinned once. In John chapter 8, he could look into the faces of his enemies and say, which one of you can prove me guilty of sin? And his enemies were silent. Secondly, he taught amazing ethical teachings that I think all of us respect highly. Mm. The Sermon on the Mount is obviously ethical genius, all right? Profound ethical genius, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. So his lifestyle, his ethical teachings demand respect. Mm. Thirdly, you watch him die. At the moment of his most excruciating pain and agony, nailed to a wooden crossbeam, instead of cursing his enemies the way I would have, he prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Mm. Well, my respect for him skyrockets. Mm. But fourthly, and most importantly, three days after he dies, he physically, bodily rises from the dead, and over a period of 40 days, he appears to over 500 people who see him, different times, different places, risen from the dead, Paul records in 1 Corinthians 15. I have a question. Mm -hmm. How do you know that? It's a good good question. Very good question. Because all these these claims that Cliff is making is, is... resting on the assumption that what the Bible says is true, right? So it's a reasonable question for somebody that's skeptical to ask, how do, how do you know? In the same way 
that you know that George Washington was the first president of the United States, that you know that Adolf Hitler really committed the atrocities he did. It's called historical knowledge. But those recent events, you, or those events you just cited, happened much more recently. Yes. And are much more well documented. Yes. Than potentially 2,000 years of lost it. Um, so uh, Cliff m m kind of missed an opportunity here to, to um, give a give like a more ancient example. He he could have he could have used many examples like about Caesar or, or Alexander the Great or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, in, instead of uh, more recent examples like Hitler. So, um, but he is correct that it's this it it's the same way that we know those those types of things as well. It's eyewitness testimony. In the case of that's why a recent more recent example is not the best in my opinion because we have like video there's more ways in which we know about like more recent events but if you go ancient there's it's it's very similar to how we know about the events of the Bible. Are we, sorry, oh, is, this, is that up. the last clip? To are we talking about that and then? Yeah, yeah. I was just more? I was gonna keep going a little bit. Why? Okay, okay. Do we, do I'll we say wanna... we're about an hour thirty. I don't know how long. We want to go. As long as the cameras keep going, I think we're good. Yeah. Just yeah. to go like well, 10 think, more minutes. Yeah. I think there's going to be parts that we can cut out too, so it'll make it shorter. Yeah. Go. Correct. But the great news is in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have a very, very reliable historical record based on over 5,800 Greek manuscripts, 10,000 manuscripts in the Latin Vulgate, and about 9,800 in Ethiopic, Coptic, Armenian, Syriac, Gothic, and Slavic. Basically, like they were, they were almost approved and 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 given credibility to in the short term thereafter, and but, and 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 that that became made it even that added a more extensive proof to the to the story. Yeah, back essentially, then. they were like corroborated. Yeah, that's like, yeah. evidence. That's kind of what I'm, I, I want to <laughs> ask a quick question about that, and you, you brought up, uh, or you brought up George Washington and 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 the atrocities of of World War II. Um, <clears throat> we live in a in a place or a time and place right now, specifically in this. I'm gonna moment. skip ahead a little bit because um, it, 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 Mike kind of goes off a little bit on an unrelated. I mean, it's not unrelated, but I, I just want to keep it to the the idea of about the historicity of the Bible here. So I'm, I think if I skip forward will probably be there all different forms of knowledge by claiming this type of certainty but what he doesn't get is christianity is all about doubt like if any christian comes up to you and says you got to have certainty or you're not you know you're not going to heaven you're going to burn in the lake of fire that's just a total joke like the man after god's own heart david was questioning god all the time job when he was going through suffering questioning god all the time oh doubting thomas he, jesus said don't doubt obviously because doubting thomas was scolded no Doubting Thomas had all the disciples who claimed eyewitness testimony to the resurrection coming to him, telling him exactly what happened. Finally, Jesus actually gives him the physical proof, says, touch the actual nail prints in my hands, thrust your hand into the spear wound in my side, then stop doubting and believe. So eventually he calls him out of his doubt. But to your good point, I'm a doubt, I've, I've doubted more than my brothers all life long. And, and my three-year-old daughter the other day was like, I don't believe in God. Like, I can't see, touch, taste. So I'm like, you're three. What is going on here? It's, it's so in the genes. I just hate it. <laughs> you just took a bite of Play-Doh. Exactly. <laughs> I can't even answer this. And so I, I love that about the Christian faith, unlike other faiths, which is, yeah. So, But it sounds like this person that you were going back and forth with is talking about your certainty and the belief of Jesus, that he existed. That's what it sounds like. And, and, and I guess that's kind of was my question as well. Like, how, like how do you know? Is Because the preservation of history is, it, excuse me, <laughs> freaking difficult. Uh -huh. that's Extremely a, difficult, by the way. Hi, history is often well written by the victors, right? <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I don't know who, who the victor is. In this. So I don't, we're not going to have time to go over like the historicity of the resurrection or the Bible in this podcast. Um, but there's, if the viewers, uh, would like to learn more about like those types of arguments, there's lots of great resources out there. Um, there's guys like William Lane Craig, Gary Habermas, Mike Lacona, just to name a few, um, who are scholars that go deep into, um, N.T. Wright is another one. N.T. Wright like wrote a huge book about the, the resurrection, um, uh, if you want to read that side of the argument, and I definitely encourage you read the skeptical side of the argument too, and and come to your own opinion about it. 
I think you will find that there's a, a surprisingly good case to be made for the resurrection just based off of the, the history of the Bible. And yes, it, it does rely on eyewitness testimony. But if you want to reject eyewitness testimony completely, you aren't going to know anything about ancient history, basically. You know, you'll know the location of a few rocks. I, you're not going to know Joey's much knows those about rocks. like people. They, they're, they're they didn't have cameras back then, and they wrote down the things that they saw. And historians have very sophistic, sophisticated ways of taking that information about what people wrote down and sifting through it and trying to figure out what, where is the truth in this? Because there's like contradictions in, in this account or, you know, inconsistencies or they exaggerate here or there. And so historians have all sorts of methods that they use to figure out what the underlying truth is. Well, let's, if you take the gospels and, and uh, the letters of the apostles and look at them as historical documents that some people wrote around that time about something that they saw. Don't assume that it's the it's the inspired word of God. Just take them as historical documents. Apply the same historical um, types of uh, methods that you would to any other ancient documents, and figure out where where you end up. And that's where a lot of scholars um, are able to come up with historical arguments for for things like the resurrection. But everyone should look into those things themselves if, if they're interested. Yeah, and I know this might be a little bit of a cop out um, for that. If, if if a non-believer says, "Well, where's the proof?" I believe that God set it up in a way that we don't have definitive proof—pictures, blood samples, whatever you want to, whatever you want. I think that God set it up that way. First of all, they didn't have that kind of technology back then, so it's unfair to say, "Well, I won't believe in it until I have you know a medical record or something." But I believe that God set it up because think about this. Would it really be true faith if without, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you, you could not disprove Jesus? You could, like, there was absolutely no proof that Jesus didn't exist. Did I say that mm -hmm. right? If, yeah. Yep. Didn't exist. If there was no proof that he didn't, yeah, yeah. Okay. Am I saying it right? I don't yeah, know. You, said Whatever. you don't understand I, what I'm I, saying. I believe so, yeah. It wouldn't really be faith because it would be a fact, the oh. way that two plus two is four. If there mm -hmm. was absolute proof that If Jesus there was absolute proof, yeah. I don't know how I was saying that. I'm just like, like it's a monster. Like percent proof. Exactly. Yeah. There, was, there was, like I'm saying, like there's a shadow, no, uh, whatever, okay. Without a shadow of a doubt. Yes. It wouldn't be true faith and we would just have to believe it because that's what is a given. We wouldn't even have conversation about it. We'd be like, yep, Jesus is, you know, God's son, came, died resurrected boom that's it that's all we have to think about so you can doubt anything though like you can if, you can but i people think people doubt joe rogan had a guy on that doubts <laughs> one one times one equals one yeah <laughs> he thinks it's two yeah like you can doubt anything dude and you can yeah, yeah but it, that's but that's just point. beyond logic i get your point, point. There, god um, could have given a lot more evidence there and there are two bible verses that go with that um that say first i think it's in corinthians or something but it says for we live by faith not sight and then um the whole situation with doubting Thomas, he says, blessed is he who who does not see and believes. But, and I know that can be a little bit of a cop-out because uh, you're just like, well, you know, God made it that way. But I think there's so much truth to that. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good spot to to wrap it up. We're, we're pushing almost two hours here, kind of. So that was definitely a good, good conversation. Good we definitely... Uh, yeah. I, I thought it was pretty cool to switch it up, do like a reaction video. So anyone mm -hmm. who's listening or watching, uh, if you guys liked it, let us know if you want us to do more reaction videos like this or similar, or if there are particular videos, clips, other podcasts that you guys would like us to do reactions to, we'd be more than happy to look into it. Let us know in the comments. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's great. I think Cliff and Stuart and Logan and Mike all had a lot of, of conversation to bring to the table and I highly encourage you guys to go and watch the full video too. do your research, look into it more. Like Milo said at the beginning of the podcast, we're not professionals here. We don't know everything, but we're doing our best to uh, share our knowledge with, with you that what we've learned through experiences and what we believe in. Um, we really definitely appreciate you guys being here with us and supporting us. We appreciate it. Remember to uh, press that subscribe button, leave a comment and a like. Uh, we would definitely appreciate that. But this is the Campfire Council <laughs> Podcast. Yeah, buddy.